Welcome to the Simple Brand Podcast, the show dedicated to helping you create simple experiences for your customers and for your team members. Each week, we're bringing you amazing interviews with business leaders and authors who will teach you how to differentiate your business with the one thing your customers need the most, simplicity. Your customers live in a complex world. Let's make it simple. Now, here's your host, Matt Lyles. Have you ever seen the movie Braveheart? I love that movie. In one of the pivotal scenes of that movie, you've got hundreds of Scottish men being faced down by thousands of British soldiers. The Scottish are outmanned. They're outgunned, outweaponed, outresourced. They're the underdogs. And the British are expecting a truce. Well, William Wallace rides up in front of the Scottish men. He gives a rousing, inspirational speech about them fighting for their freedom. And then the British, then the British are expecting the Scottish to sign a truce. Instead, William Wallace rides out to talk to the British, and some of his friends ask him, they say, well, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to pick a fight. And th- that, that was my best attempt at a Scottish accent. I'm sorry. He's going to pick a fight. And every single one of those Scottish men were willing to follow right along with him and fight for their freedom. But now, how do you think it would have gone if William Wallace had gotten in front of those men and said, well, for us to gain our independence, here's my mission statement that I have laid out. Or here are my seven strategic initiatives laid out in a bullet point format and a PowerPoint presentation that I'll walk through for the next 30 minutes. Those guys would have either fallen asleep or they would have just ran away. But how many times are you sitting in front of some of your leaders and they're doing the same thing? They're trying to motivate you. They're trying to inspire you with a boring mission statement or boring strategic initiatives. The people, the teams that are more motivated, the teams that are the most successful, the companies that are the most successful, they're motivated because they picked a fight. And that's what we're going to talk about today. One of my newest good friends, David Burkus, has actually written the book called Pick a Fight. And it walks through how leaders can use a crusade, can use a fight to inspire their team members. And it's not infighting, not fighting each other. And you're not fighting competitors either. We'll talk about that later. It's understanding the right fight to pick and having those people follow along, going along and fighting that fight. And I'm thrilled that I got to talk to David about this. David has written, you know, at least, what, two or three award-winning books. He's got a TED Talk that's been viewed over two million times. He's been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, USA Today, Fast Company, and me, Matt Lyles. And for the past four years, he's also been ranked as one of the top world business thought leaders by Thinkers 50. And I think he's just an all-around great guy. Now, you know, I could go all day and gush about David, but I'm assuming that you'd rather hear him talk than me just talk about him. So let's go ahead, get to the interview with me and David Burkus talking about Pick a Fight. Hey, David, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Well, so first things first, Congratulations. Congratulations on launching, uh, an, launching another book. But rather, actually, this was launched via Just Audible. This is an Audible exclusive, right? This is, we relaunched it in partnership with Audible, but you actually can get it iTunes or Scribd or wherever you listen to audio books. Um, but Audible, we released it in partnership with Audible, yeah. The goal with that, you know, I've been paying attention 
to the market for a while now and more audiobooks are the only segment of the market that are growing. Um, so there's that idea. Uh, but also when you look at middle managers, leaders, small business owners, the people that I was trying to target with this message that you need to find your fight, you need to pick your fight wisely. Um, they, they read with their ears now. And so it just made sense. Yeah. Why, why not create something that was actually, um, uh, you know, bingeable for them and listenable for them in that format. In fact, funny story, we actually were planning to do a whole thing with musical interludes and making it sound like sort of a two and a half hour long podcast. And then again, we went back and looked at what the market was and the exact people were targeting. They listen on one and a quarter or one and a half speed. So we realized that was going to actually screw it all up. So we went back to that audio format. Luckily though, they still liked the idea of me narrating it. So that was a win. Well, there you go. Yeah, pe- people do like to hear your voice. But to your point, yeah, th- there's been a few times where, you know, maybe not on my initial listen, but if I'm trying to go back and rehear a certain chapter, I'll listen to it at one and a quarter speed. Yeah, yeah. So we realized as much as I love, so I, as I was producing this with Audible, um, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, Talking to Strangers came out, which has, which has just demolished the, pr- the print and ebook versions. Uh, Talking to Strangers in audio has just done uh, an insane number of sales compared to the others. And it's beautiful to listen to because he took his whole revisionist history podcast team, musical interludes, he had actors reading court transcripts and live interviews when you could get the audio. And it's fantastic, but you can't listen to it on one and a half or one and a quarter because it just messes right. it up, right? It's a beautiful audio experience, but you know, if you, if you want to binge and speed through and get the gist and all that sort of stuff, you can't. So it's been really weird designing. I mean, normally my, my first three books were 60,000 words and you can take this sort of longer journey to almost uh, get the reader to arrive at the conclusion before you hit the conclusion. And this has been a really fun experiment to, to re to write a book that is literally that, can I get you everything you need to know inside of two hours? Um, It was honestly, it was a challenge, but it was a lot of fun doing it sounds like an exercise in making sure that you can get really clear and really cut to the chase. Yeah. Which is ironically what the book is about. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and the title, you know, pick a fight. When I read that and I think of some people hearing the words, you know, pick a fight, pick a fight sounds pretty harsh. So, (laughs) you know, why not just use terms like, in, in, instead of picking a fight, why not use, oh, I don't know, strategic initiative or mission statement or beat our competitors? Did you roll your eyes while you um, said those things? Because I rolled my eyes when I, when I heard them, right? And I think most people listen to you too. So there's part of your answer. Pretty much. No, in all seriousness, <laughs> I get it. It's a deliberately provocative phrase. But, but here's what I ran into. There's two things I'm trying to do with this. The first is I'm trying to take back the word fight because I think for I don't know, 50 years, we've talked about business as war, war for talent, battle for market share, all that sort of stuff. And then fight right. creates this idea that what you're supposed to be fighting against is your competitor. And the truth is, when we look at human motivation, like that doesn't motivate people. At least it doesn't motivate people towards the right aims. And it doesn't motivate them at a deeper level. It's not about who you're fighting. It's about what you're fighting for. So we're trying to take back that word fight in that regard, which unfortunately means putting that word out there front and center. And, you know, 3% of people so far that I've encountered have had a big problem with the, the word. It, it, the rest have either loved it or given me a chance, which is all I'm asking for. Um, the, the other reason is I just couldn't find a better word to describe it. Because here's what I think, strategic initiatives, purpose, vision, that these, these terms are vague. And I think that's a oh, huge yeah. problem. We've known for 20 years now, at minimum, maybe longer, that being a mission-driven organization, a vision-driven company, purpose-driven, whatever term you want to use, um, that we've known that's important. And yet the needle hasn't moved on things like employee engagement, right? The needle hasn't moved on teams feeling less and less like Dilbert or the office and more and more engaged. It's just, it just it stayed flat. And I think one of the big reasons for that is that those terms are, are too vague and often too utopian without telling me what's at stake when we fail. I think that's the new thing that I'm trying right. to bring into this conversation is it's not enough to just say, here's the beautiful future we're working towards. It's also that we're working against something that will lead to a darker future. That idea of that sort of outside threat or outside adversity, it gives stakes to the mission, the vision, the purpose. And that stakes is what actually bonds people together and motivates them towards that. That goal. And I can't think 
of another word for that other than fight. I mean, there's a lot of synonyms I use. Like in the book, we talk about how people don't want to join a company. They want to join a crusade or we talk about a revolution or a reformation, but they're all a form of what we'd call fight. And I don't mean fight like war. I'm not, I am not qualified, right. To be, to try and pretend to be one of the Navy SEALs taking (laughs) battlefield lessons. And I'm not Jocko, right. But I don't mean it in that regard. I mean it the way politicians will tell you they're fighting an injustice, right. Or that revolutionaries tell you they're fighting for change. That's what I, the, the way that I mean it. And that's a kind of a deeper, uh, more visceral and more motivating thing than some of these vague terms like strategic initiatives or just purpose. And, and, and it gives a sense of something to really rally around, you know, but I want to go back to one of the things you said, talking about uh, competitors. What I've noticed is if you're a large organization, your front line doesn't care about your direct competitors as much as you do. No, in leader. fact, some of them are going to go to work for your competitors in the next 12 months. So, Absolutely. So there's that, right? Well, there, there, there is. But, and, and sometimes, and, and I love seeing this. I love seeing this on social media sometimes where you'll see two or three different frontline team members from different direct competitors that may have come together to help solve a problem for somebody. Like uh, I love seeing, you know, where there's maybe delivery companies um, and one driver has a flat tire and the other one gets out and helps him because he, you know, because his truck broke down. And to me, that says that they have a better understanding of the fight that they're fighting and, and it's not their competitors, you know, they're, they're fighting for their customers. Yeah. They, I mean, they, exactly. They have a different, uh, the, the term in the literature and the research literature is superordinate goal. They have a superordinate goal. What is that reason that we're doing this? I mean, right now we're recording this in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, right? And, and FedEx, oh, yeah. uh, Amazon, UPS, the mail, all, all of those people have become these essential sort of vital services for a lot of people, as well as anyone in essential business, grocers, obviously healthcare workers, et cetera. But like that right. bonds them together much more than the debate over whether you should UPS something or FedEx it has ever done that. It's really only, in my opinion, it's only really in the mind of the senior leaders who are pouring over pie charts of market share that it even cares, right? What mission do both of those companies serve? What are they fighting for at a deeper level? What's that superordinate goal? And no wonder those people who see each other every single day, even though they work for competitive companies, feel an affiliation because they're actually doing that same work, fighting that same fight, even when their senior leaders are, are confused and thinking somehow that we should separate that out. Yeah, it's, it's just, I mean, that's, that's one of, the, it's, I think the third chapter in the book, right? As we know, fights motivate, fights bond, but not, when you try and fight your rivals, figure out that bigger thing that even your rivals are fighting for and point everyone's attention to that. Right. Right. And, and, and it drives more of that internal motivation in everyone, you know, not just the leadership. Yeah. Well, so what are some obstacles that can prevent a fight from taking hold throughout a company? Yeah. I mean, I, I think in some regard we have this, um, we have this tendency, what's the term I'm trying to remember the acro- B hags, right? Big, oh, hairy, audacious, big hairy, goals. audacious goals. We have this, um, we have this line of consultants that are, that get paid, you know, I don't know, 20 grand to come lead an offsite to write a vision statement, that sort of thing. And, um, those are all great. And those are all, I mean, they're fighting the same fight I'm fighting. So I'm not trying to criticize rivals here. Right. But what they're not thinking about is that that stakes portion. And they're not, to my mind, they're not thinking about how to bridge the gap. The, the big hurdle that I see is there is a gap if you look at how mission and purpose actually engage people. Right. So, so the Gallup organization, right. Famous for the Q12, their engagement score. Right. It's been used for 20 plus years. It's been flat in North America for 20. Well, it's moved a teeny bit, but like not statistically significant. Um, One of the questions in their 12 question survey of employee engagement is, does the mission and the vision of the company make me feel my day to day work is important? Now, which one of those we we solved the first one, we've got a mission, you've got a purpose, Every, every publicly traded company has a paragraph in the front of their 10k to tell us what your purpose is. Oh, yeah, we never really thought about the second part right? We don't actually think about how do you, how do you embed that purpose in culture? How do you make sure people have reminders of it from day to day? I mean, we get so tripped up in this idea that leaders are supposed to cast a vision that we don't realize that the bigger challenge for leaders is to take that top level vision and get people to see that driving the UPS truck on a day-to-day basis serves that vision, 
right? To that oh, day to day task that people are asked to do. That's, I wouldn't call it a hurdle. I would call it this sort of chasm that people just often aren't willing to jump over because it takes a lot longer than a weekend offsite with the senior leaders <laughs> to come up with a fancy phrase. It takes a lot more work to do that, but it's worth it. It really is. And, you know, a lot of times I wonder when you have leadership that's crafting whatever statement, if it's their purpose statement, their vision statement, their mission statement, if they have that understanding, that end in mind where they say, we are crafting this for our team members, for our front line. Uh, because a lot of times, and I read an article last week, I think, and I think the stat was, it, it was more than a third, more than a third of companies' mission statements focus on their shareholders. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, again, they're in the front of a 10K. So I totally understand oh, yeah. why, who's reading a 10K and all that sort of thing. No, I mean, it gets even worse, right? Like um, there's a survey in, in uh, I think it's Daniel Coyle's book about teams, uh, the culture code, where he talks about how less than 2% or maybe it's three, but it's a single digit number percent of employees could tell you their organization's top three priorities, right? Oh, yeah. uh, and, and again, I think it's because we're not bridging that gap. Now, what bridges that gap? This is where my grand thesis comes into play that I believe that reframing that mission and purpose as they fight and then focusing your efforts as a leader or as a, a middle manager, whatever, it, any leadership role you're in, even if you don't have a title, refocusing that fight to say, here is how your individual efforts, here's how you help combat this fight. Those are the things that, that bridge that gap. And, and I truthfully believe it's got to be, it's got to have that stakes. It's got to have that sense of urgency that most of these shareholder value oriented mission statements lack. Um, and there's a couple different templates that we outline in the book for how you can kind of better phrase that to make sure you have that stakes piece. But if you're not doing that, you're not creating that sense of urgency that I think keeps people more motivated from the day to day than this grand utopian vision that's 20 years off that assumes we made all our shareholders wealthy and here's what the world looks like after we do that. Right. And, you know, and once, once you've defined that fight, you've got to be able to have everybody, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, everybody buy into that fight. Well, here's a, so here's a common misconception, right? Depending on the size of your organization, buy-in it should be less of a concern than picking the right fight. That's, that's actually why the book's called Pick a Fight, right? Because you also have to choose your fight wisely. Right, um, yeah. So, and here's what I mean by that. If you're, a, if you're a startup organization, you're a small business, if you're in a situation where the founding story is still told by the founder because he or she is still alive, that's important, um, that but, also, but also everyone directly reports to that person, right? So if you're a five-person organization, then casting oh. a vision and getting by, and that can all work because people are going to see you as the founder every single day. Right. But if you have even three levels of hierarchy where there's any level of removal, between yourself and that founder, then it's a lot harder to do that vision buy-in thing. And it's a lot easier to look at what is the fight that your people already want to pick? What is the thing that resonates with them? The biggest number of people? Is it talking about customers and how you serve them? Is it talking about the larger way you're taking on the industry? It varies by organization. But this is, I think, a big misconception about a lot of stuff, right? Great leaders, or we could even just say successful leaders, don't cast a vision and get buy-in. Great leaders find a way to put to words the vision, the mission, the purpose, the fight that's already on the minds and hearts of their people, right? And all they did was put it to words. Martin Luther King, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, I have a dream speech, but it's actually, this is all of our dream speech, right? That's what right. he actually um, spoke to. When you look at any, any major revolution, reformation, et cetera, it didn't start with, here's my vision for the world. Let me sell you on why you need to adopt it. No, it said, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of people in here who feel like this is an injustice worth taking on. Or it sounds like there's a lot of people here that feel like this needs to be changed for us to proceed as a society. It starts with that group census and the, the the people that become leaders in that sense are really just the ones that put to words that. So it really depends on the size of the organization. If you're just starting out, I think you can get away with that buy-in piece. If you're not, it starts with your people. Figure out what will actually resonate with your people. Wow. No, that, that is really powerful. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, like one of the big words to talk about in, you know, leadership and relationship management today is empathy. And I don't know how much, you know, leaders really, really understand empathy and how to empathize with your team members, but that's one way right there. Instead of you, you know, defining 
what you're going to fight for and throw that out to your people. It's listening to your people and taking what they say the fight is and putting it back, you know, into your words and putting it back to them. And I can see how people would, would want to join in because to me that, that would say, you know what? He gets us, he or she gets us, you know, she listened to us and what we want to fight and he can rally us around together. Yeah. That's yeah. I, no, exactly. And we, you know, when, when we work with organizations, we have this larger sort of find your fight program. That's a little more complicated than that. But when I'm just one off talking oh, yeah. to an individual leader or team manager, the thing that I'll say is ask your people two questions in the next week, corner every person that's on your team and ask them two questions. Make sure you mention they're not in trouble because these questions might come off as like a pop quiz and you're going to get fired if you don't answer. Right. And that's not <laughs> what we're doing. Right. But here are the two questions. What do we do here? That's it. What do we do here? What do we as an organization do? And how does what you do help us do that? The first question you're looking for who they talk about. When they talk about what we do here, do they talk about customers? Do they talk about the way you're changing the industry? Do they talk about your reputation in the industry? These all hint at one of the different templates of fights um, that are in the book. And then how does what we do here, how does what you do help us do that tells you how much work you have to do reminding them and pointing to that fight in terms of their day-to-day activity. So you can get a a lot out of those two little questions in terms of figuring out what you need to do over the next weeks and months to find the right fight, the one that will resonate the most with them, which is the what do we do here question, and then find a way to connect everybody's day-to-day activities to that larger fight. I think for a lot of leaders, like that can be some sobering information that comes out of those questions. Yeah. The, the most common thing that happens, by the way, uh, with, <laughs> through every organization we've worked with, the most common thing that happens is that whatever the leader's answer to what do we do here is, it's almost never the majority of responses, right? So oh, like I, when, when I, I believe was building it. out, yeah, when I was building out the book and the program, one of my beta people um, was a guy named Jesse Cole, who runs the Savannah Bananas, which is the most amazing baseball franchise in history, even though they are, you know, what are the Yankees yeah. worth? A billion dollars. They're worth maybe a dollar. Um, they're a minor, <laughs> minor, minor. A little more. Right, a little more. But they're a minor, 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 minor league baseball team. They play in the summer. They use college athletes. Yeah. And they are so sold out to the fan experience. When I first started yes. working with Jesse, though, he would talk about the way he's changing the game of baseball because it's boring and kids don't want to watch baseball, which means they don't want to play t-ball, which means they don't, that we won't have future baseball athletes because the game itself is so boring and commercialized. And then he went and he asked his people, what do we do here? How's what we do? Every single one of them talked about fans, not about the revolution that he was that he had in his mind. Right, every single one of them talked about their their how they were basically fighting for a, a fan experience, a family experience. How how baseball, major league stadiums are nickel and diming families and ripping them all off, and they are just so focused. They don't even take advertising inside the stadium because they're just so focused on that fan experience. Right, so it's a mismatch. Wow. Thankfully, he's the type of leader that is smart and also humble enough to go, yeah, you know what? My messaging when I talk about our fight needs. To to be around fans as well, because that's what resonates with their people. But yeah, the most common thing that happens is you realize there's a disconnect between what at the senior leadership level you think you're fighting for and what your people actually will resonate with. And I think there was something, I think something else you mentioned earlier was ensuring that the the leadership can continue to say what the fight is and can, and repeats it to everyone. Because A lot, a lot of times, you know, and especially from my experience, you know, uh, I'll see a senior leader and, and I say, and I, th- I think I got this, um, Chip and Dan Heath, uh, the Heath brothers, yeah. um, they, they talk about the curse of knowledge. And I think when, when a leader spends, you know, uh, months kind of crafting the language of their, you know, uh, of their initiative or their mission, they have the curse of knowledge. Like they know exactly what it is. And so in their head, they feel that they have to say it just one time to their people and their people should get it and remember every day. And yeah. It's a and, big and, what, and I should add here that, that repeating it too doesn't mean just like starting every meeting with a pledge of mission statement oh, or something like no, that, right? No. <laughs> your, your job as leader actually after you, after you sort of put to words that vision is to become almost like chief storyteller at that point. Yes. Your, your job yeah. is not just to say the mission, but to find the stories 
of small wins along the way, or if, if you're what I call the revolutionary fight to find uh, examples of the way the industry is taking advantage of people and the way you're not because you're doing things differently. Like making sure you, and this may not just CEO, but like senior leadership team as a whole. And if they're not doing it, then you leader at whatever level you are, this is your job um, to find those stories, capture them and tell them to your people. Cause what you want isn't to you, what you want is to repeat that fight often. Right. What you don't want is to be the only person to that. You want your right. people telling those stories to each other and in doing so, reminding each other of the mission, even if they use slightly different words for each one. Like there's not this isn't a pop quiz on get it 100 percent right. Um, but if <laughs> but if, they, if they're aligned with it, if they can point to it because they can repeat all these different stories that are examples of it, that's what you want, because then it's not it's not one to many over and over and over again. It's many to many reinforcing that if you look at the way culture is formed on an anthropological right level, this is how it happens. It happens through telling those stories that reinforce those sacred values. And I think it's that storytelling that helps your people understand what the mission really means. Because you, you, can, you can try and create a very clear and concise uh, fight or rallying cry, and people may get it, but once they see it in action in those stories, I think like that's, to, to your point, that, that's where it really takes hold. Yeah, um, and, and the research backs this up. There's actually a fascinating study by Adam Grant. It's one of his least popular studies, which is actually <laughs> not about the study. It just shows you how popular Adam Grant is. And right. they could, the word for it is salience. And in terms of the salience of the mission statement to everybody, the, the awareness of the mission statement among everybody, sharing those stories, seeing stories of people who have been impacted by the work you do travels a whole lot further than just hearing the leader tell you the mission or even hearing the leader tell you the story right? Seeing the story or hearing the story from a peer, all of those things have greater salience than just the leader repeating it over and over again. So that's where we go. I will point to an example of something from my previous career. And I, I think I've shared with this with you before is um, I like to say that I was leading, help, helping lead a crusade of simplicity for FedEx. Mm. And today, if you go out to uh, purplepromise.fedex.com, that is a site that talks about the FedEx crusade for simplicity. But on that site are numbers of videos and blog articles showing individual team member success stories, frontline team members, team members in customer support, team members in finance and IT, all around how they're showing examples of what that simplicity crusade means. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, it, it's it's so fun, and and I think when when team members can see stories of other uh, non leadership, non manager team members, uh, you know, fighting that fight, then in their head, I think they, they're able to say, well, you know what, that person did it, I can too. Yeah, I mean that's exactly right, and it it travels. All. What I love about that is that you capture them. In, in video from the actual person, which again, the research lines yeah. up with goes a whole lot further than just we're at the annual company, you know, uh, the opening, what are you, whatever you call that opening annual meeting to rally everybody, which happens in some organizations, not in others. Uh, but so often I hear the 90, I, I'm, I go to these, I speak at these and I'm the keynoter, but the real keynote, because he gets a longer time than me or she is the CEO. Right. right? right. Um, and I often hear the CEO telling that story instead of like, do you know how powerful it would be to just like, you stop talking for two minutes and you show me a video of them telling yeah. me their story. That's a yeah. whole lot more powerful. And that's, that's your real job um, as a leader. The other thing I love about this, just candidly, is you go back to a lot of the research, there's this mistaken assumption about leaders that they're supposed to be extroverts and charismatic and all this sort of stuff. There's a lot of amazing leaders who are more introverted, who aren't well-spoken, et cetera. Uh, and so this is actually something that serves them better, stepping, taking, stepping out of the spotlight because they don't have to rely on their charisma and just pointing, using your office to point to better those stories. Not only does it go a lot further, it's more applicable to more uh, leaders depending on your personality and all that sort of thing. Even going back to... Uh back to biblical times in the old Testament, uh, Moses and Aaron, you know, Moses was the leader, but he was an introvert and, you know, didn't, he, he wasn't a great speaker. So he used Aaron. That's a good point. I didn't even actually, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we can go that far back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and, and picking a fight, I mean, the, the, 
the way that you're talking about it now, that, that makes it sound pretty simple. But I've got to think that, you know, based on industry, based on company, based on a variety of factors, there, that it's not as just simple as just uh, rallying people around a fight. I mean, and I think you alluded to this earlier. You know, there uh, are, it sounds like there are more tailored types of fights depending yeah. on the situation at hand. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the simplest way that I can explain it is that your job is to give people a clear and concise answer to the question, what are we fighting for? But not all answers motivate the same level. And so I scoured right. the, the research and looked through all the different research on motivation on teams, et cetera. And I basically arrived at three templates, all of which fall inside the, the larger picture of intrinsic motivation, reasons other than monetary rewards and that sort of thing that people feel motivated to put in the effort. Um, and I, I kind of, I created, they're almost like Mad Libs for, um, for fights, which is, I realized <laughs> no, that's that. That's fun. <laughs> right, no, I mean, that, that's fun, not fight. But yeah, they're almost like that. They're, they're sort of templates that you can use. So the three fights are the revolutionary fight, the underdog fight, and the ally fight. Uh, the revolutionary fight, really quick, is anytime you can point to the industry or society or some status quo, and you can say, everybody finds this acceptable and we refuse to accept that any longer, right? So you fill in the blank on what this is. It can be a norm, it can be a technology, it can be a trade practice, whatever it is. Everybody finds this acceptable. We refuse to accept that any longer. And so by doing business a little bit differently to eschew that norm or to set a new standard, we are starting our own little revolution inside of our organization or starting our own revolution against the industry because we refuse to accept that norm any longer. The underdog fight is, it's not about being the little guy. Um, I mean, that can motivate, uh, yeah. especially founders and startups are just motivated by being small and scrappy. But the truth is for an underdog fight to work, you need not only a, a rejection, somebody calling you small or insignificant, you need a plan that you can point to for your people on here's how we're going to prove them wrong. There's actually been a lot of research in the last five years on the underdog narrative as a motivating force. And it requires both of those things. You need to not just be rejected. You also need a rebuttal. You need a way to prove the haters wrong. And when you can point to both of those things, you can light a fire in your people pretty easily. And then the ally fight is actually, uh, dare I say the simplest of them, the ally fight quite <laughs> simply says, it's not about our fight, it's about their fight. And here's how we help them win. And here's the thing, you get to define they however you want. Everybody defaults to shareholders and mission statements, which is a mistake. And even when I talk about the ally fight, often their initial response is, yeah, it's about the customer's fight. And it doesn't always have to be the customer. It can be someone else who benefits from your business model as well. You get to define they. But whoever it is, your job as a leader becomes making sure people see the impact of their work on that they, whoever it is. And I, I love that one. And I love, you know, it, ensuring that, you know, it's not just about the shareholder, but if it's not about the customer, then who could that ally be? Yeah. So um, I'll give you my favorite example in the universe. Um, because I grew up going to Hershey Park in Hershey, Pennsylvania, like, every single year. Oh, fun. Um, and as I got older, I started reading different biographies of Milton Hershey and what I realized, and I've actually, I should say, I have on record multiple times laughed at the Hershey Foods organization uh, because for, for a number of years, they had a terrible mission statement and they deserved every bit of laughter <laughs> um, that I gave to them. However, it never mattered. Their people were motivated nonetheless. And here's why. When I was reading up on Milton Hershey, I found something amazing, which is that Milton and his wife adopted a lot of children. Uh, they couldn't have kids on their own, so they adopted a lot of orphans. That grew into when his wife passed away, Milton started and funded a school for orphans, the Hershey School for Orphans. It is still there to this day. Uh, it graduates about 900 to 1,000 kids every year who are biological and societal orphans. But here's the craziest wow. thing. When Milton was preparing his estate, when he was getting ready to go, Milton gifted all of his shares in the Hershey company to a trust that runs the school. So this isn't like BOGO, which is really popular right now. And it's not like corporate social responsibility. That right. school for orphans is the majority shareholder of the Hershey organization, right? So Whoa. you ask them what, and, and by the way, if you go to Hershey, Pennsylvania, you drive there, the park, the school and the home offices of the company are all like a block from each other. You can see the school from the park. You can see the school from the home offices, the headquarters. Everybody in headquarters knows what they're fighting for, right? Because they know who their yeah. boss is. Their boss are those kids, right? And so you ask them, who are you fighting for, right? And they, they, to their credit, I mean, they've never used fight rhetoric before. And you don't have to either. My, my, I use it as a litmus test. If I walked into your front office and I asked your people, 
what are you fighting for? If they understood that question, they can give me a clear and concise answer. You've done your job. And Hershey has definitely done that. Because if I walked into their home offices and asked anybody, they go, we're fighting for those kids right over there because we keep that thing in business, right? That we're, we're, they're still the majority shareholder in the company even to this day. And that's not the customer, although that those kids probably do buy a lot of Hershey's chocolate as yeah. they go throughout their life. That's not their, their, the customer isn't the they, right? Those kids are. Wow. Oh, that, that's, that's really powerful. And the, that, that actually reminds me of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Yeah. Right? And, and they're headquartered in Memphis and their, uh, their business side or their fundraising side, ALSAC, um, is its own company, but they're right next door to the hospital. And, you know, and, and at any time, any employee can, you know, walk right over, walk into the hospital, walk around. They all eat at the same cafeteria, you know, and you'll, you'll see families and you'll see patients and children there. And, and everybody there knows like, like that, like that person right there, that's who we're fighting for. I love that. Yeah, exactly. And what, so in your example, especially what, what I love is the need to point that out. There's a lot of organizations that are in the ally fight that quite frankly, do a terrible job reminding their people of who they're fighting for. One of the stories we talk about in the book uh, is the company Kaiser Permanente. They're, but don't worry, they're a good example. Um, <laughs> but they, they started a program to tackle that exact problem. So the problem was that like, they're a healthcare organization. It's obvious who their ally is, who they're helping fight. They're helping f- people's fight to stay alive and stay healthy and stay vibrant, right? Um, but not everybody gets to see that. The doctors and nurses that interact with the patient from day to day, they get to see it the call center receptionist who schedules these millions, these hundreds of thousands or millions of patients, et cetera, doesn't always get to see it. So they set up this system. It's called the I Saved a Life campaign. And basically what happens is if you called in to schedule an appointment with, I don't know, your ear, nose, and throat doctor, right? Because you've got a respiratory infection or something like that, right? You're, or you've got a, I don't know, an ear infection or something like that. You're, you, you call that the receptionist there can actually see your total health history because Kaiser Permanente uses a, an electronic health record that um, you see the whole patient's history, in, even from other specialties. And that, that receptionist notice, hey, you know what, you're overdue for a colonoscopy or you're overdue for an A1C you know, diabetes screening and schedules you for that. If they find something, you go to that screening and they find a polyp or cancer or something like that. Or you find that, yeah, you're, able, you're actually a borderline type 2 diabetic and we need to make an intervention now. They consider that a life saved. And you know who saved it? The receptionist. So they celebrate that. Their certificates, pins, different, different branches do the celebration a little bit differently. But every time, oh. even those people are celebrated. So that's the big, to me, the big hurdle with the ally fight. A lot of organizations are in that ally fight, but they're not doing a good enough job making sure every single person in the organization understands the fight and sees how their day-to-day work fits into that. And Kaiser Permanente's I Saved the Life campaign is a fantastic example of that. That is amazing. Um, yeah, and, and, and to your point, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it would help if more companies found a way to recognize and showcase to their team members, you know, this is who you're helping. This is, this is what you as an individual have done. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, the, the way that I've, I've often started describing it, and I should have put this in the book, is that the, the thing that I find tragic is that when you look at the messaging that comes out of most organizations' home office, It's all metrics. We increased, we grew this much in revenue or we increased market share this much. Metrics aren't meaning. And the job of a leader is to add meaning to those metrics, right? Show me how that increase is also lives changed, right? Show me how that increase in revenue makes progress on the revolution that we're trying to fight. That's the job of a leader is to add meaning to those metrics, not just say the metrics, right? I mean, that's the equivalent of being like, uh, hey, congratulations. We've been driving for several hours and we have now increased our average speed from 65 miles an hour to 70 miles an hour. What's missing from that? Yeah, Where the heck are we going? Yeah. Right? Do I, do I, are we going to Disneyland? Because yeah. well, we can't go to Disneyland. Hooray, kids, you've, right. you've, you've arrived. Right. right? Um, are we going to Wally World and it's going to be closed? Yeah. Where are we going? Right? Tell me that <laughs> first. And then your metric has meaning. That really helps. And, and, and you're right. It's all about providing that meaning. Well, and, you know, we, we think about allies and I go back to the customer and I can understand the customer and their role in the fight. Is there ever a time where, where you can get the customer to join in on the fight? Yeah. I mean, I actually think, so the, you know, the ally fight is about, here's what you're already fighting and we come alongside you. So by definition, your customer's already in that fight, right? Oh. But the interesting thing about the revolutionary fight 
is that it um, it sort of takes on that same thing. So one of the one of the um, one of the companies we talk about in the book is Elevest. Elevest is a robo advisor like uh, Wealthfront or Betterment. Uh, if you're an avid podcast listener, which you probably are because you're listening yeah. to this show, I'm sure you've there seen Wealthfront. You've listened to it advertised on TV, right? It's a robo advisor. There's an algorithm that looks at your numbers, uh, looks at what you have now, makes some investment decisions and plugs you into a bunch of different index funds. Here's what's interesting. Sally Krawcheck, the founder of Elevest, is a longtime Wall Street veteran. And one of the things that she figured out is that the problem with Wall Street isn't that women aren't cut out for Wall Street, it's that Wall Street isn't cut out for women. And specifically when it comes to these robo-advisors, a lot of them actually make the assumption that their user is a male. And there's, there's a couple problems with that, right? The biggest being women have a much longer life expectancy. So you need money to last longer. Right. Uh, women are a bit more risk averse. Women are more likely to make less money than men over time, right? Women are more likely to have career gaps for caretaking. All of these things are not getting factored into those algorithms. So she started her own. She started Elevest, right? Elevest is, we are, we're better mentor Wealthfront, but we're specifically towards women. We're specifically, we've done the job of serving it. Their customer avatar, she's named L, obviously, is, uh, is, is that person that's a woman managing her money on her own, et cetera. Now, what I found fascinating when I was doing all this research is Elevest doesn't have the assets under management that any of these larger organizations have. But there's one metric that's really, really powerful, which is that their cost of customer acquisition is like fourfold lower than any of these other companies. Why? Because they're a revolution and their customers by signing up for Elevest are joining that revolution. Right, so when you do that, you you automatically are recruiting people into that. I think it works with the underdog fight as well, but I think the revolutionary fight is that one that basically says, if you're doing business with us, you are part of this revolution, and you'll find that when you do that, again, things like cost of customer acquisition, customer loyalty, et cetera, uh, word of mouth, all of those things increase because you're part of something bigger now. You're part of a revolution. And to me, that that makes it sound like there's camaraderie of the customer with the company and the customer and, and the customer with other customers. Yeah, absolutely. They're, I mean, they're, they're the, all the brands that do this end up with people tattooing the logo on their arm, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm kind of struggling here because I keep thinking that a lot of the fights, you know, and I know you were saying that a great leader listens to team members, listens to employees, and then takes the fight from their words and then kind of puts it back. But what if you're, not the leader and you and you recognize the need for a fight what if you're somewhere in middle management and you're the only one that recognizes the need to pick a fight then what yeah. can you do so i think you have two options um and it really depends on what the already existing or declared purpose mission vision of the organization are right a lot That's of times true. more recently i've been working with a lot of organizations and i will outline to a team of middle managers or even kind of senior senior leaders but not c suite i'll outline this idea and the three fights and then i will throw a slide up there with their mission statement on it i'll go all right which one right and about half of them could see how we change a few words and we arrive at that fight which is great actually better than expected um, so if you're in that situation, then it's really your job to sort of reframe the existing mission statement as that fight, right? So, I mean, I was working with an organization probably a week ago and we looked at the existing mission. It was verbose and stupid. Um, that's why I won't <laughs> tell you what company it was. Um, but in it, you could see the seed of an ally fight in there, right? This, this oh. idea that what they were doing by providing the service to their customers, they're making it easier to be adaptive to changes in, in the business environment, which we're all going through right now. And so they could see that like the little inkling of that ally fight. So if you can do that as a, as a middle manager, that's great because then again, you're not going to get in any trouble with senior leaders. Right. Like you're just making their words more applicable. So if you can do that, I would start there, see how you can take the existing mission vision and sort of reframe it as a revolution or underdog or an ally fight. If you can't, then you do those same two questions. What do we do here? How does what you do help us do that? And maybe you arrive at a vision for just your team. Are they going to do a little mini revolution inside the company because they do things a little bit differently than all the other sales teams? Uh, are they the underdog because they've been, you know, low in the rankings for so long, but now we have a plan to, to rally it, right? So you could also, if they don't have that existing mission and vision, you could find a way to do it as a story you tell about your team inside the organization. Um, and, and sometimes, to be honest with you, sometimes you just have to, Tell people, I know this is what the mission statement, this would be the third scenario. I know what the mission statement says. Here's what we really do. 
right? Here's how we really serve the world. And it just becomes your job uh, to do that. And hopefully you create this little pocket of excellence in, in your team that other people see and start adapting to, right? So there's, those are kind of, in my mind, the three options if you can't change. Ironically, about half the time, most of the organizations I work with, just like we were talking about earlier with the gap, right? They have an existing mission and vision that could be framed as one of these. We just didn't do the cognitive work of laying out the stakes. We did right. a great job assuming the word shareholder isn't in there we did, or is, or is in there alongside a lot of other people, I should yeah. clarify. Um, or not first. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, as, as long as we, uh, we did all of that, but we didn't do the cognitive work of telling us the stakes. Sometimes it's just that. Sometimes that's all you need to yeah. do as a middle manager, right? Other times you got to get a little more complicated, but no, you're not out of luck. Uh, there's, it's, it's not like quit and go find another mission driven organization. There are things you can do inside that if you don't have the power to change the declared mission statement. We've talked a lot about fighting and I, I, I'm ready to head outside and go lead my own crusade. In, in fact, that, that's what I am doing, you know, my crusade of simplicity. But I know there's a lot more to learn from you. Where can people go to learn more lessons from you? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you double tap the cover art and you're uh, on your podcast player and there's a ton, <laughs> a ton there. DavidBurgess.com, B-U-R-K-U-S is probably the easiest place. We got a ton of resources on that site. They're, they're totally free, including like questionnaires, evaluations of the mission statement, but also questionnaires or slide decks you can use with your team to talk purpose um, with them. We've got all of that sort of stuff there and, and links to whatever social media site that is your favorite other than TikTok. <laughs> I haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, I'm there and I'd love to chat yeah. with people on it. So I'd love to keep this conversation going on, on any of those. All right. One last question. And I think we talked about this earlier. Uh, this is something that I ask different guests. If you're to create a five to 10 song soundtrack for pick a fight, what would it include? Ah, the pick a fight EP. I love it. Uh, yeah. Well, I can tell you that that uh, what's her face's fight song would not be on it. Um, <laughs> not that it's not poppy and energizing, but there's no meaning in the lyrics, right? Right. You gotta um, have the meaning. Right. I mean, if 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 the opening ballad of the chorus is "This is my fight song," like, no, you still haven't told me what you're fighting for. So it's probably not that. <laughs> Um, you know, I would say I'm actually a big fan of this band. I've been a big fan of the band Switchfoot for a really, really long time. Oh, they have this song from like 15 years ago called maybe it's 15, maybe it's 10. I don't know. I'm getting old called meant to live, which is about this idea that we were meant to live for so much more than people do in their day to day. And I think that applies right. to work too, right? Like people were meant to, or want to do deeper work than most organizations are calling their people to, right? People don't want to join a company. They want to join a crusade. That song really gets at that idea. So that would be like the, yeah. that'd be my why fights, uh, song right and then when i look at like revolution underdog ally let's pick fight let's pick songs for those so um only because i'm going to date myself with my age and the way in <laughs> which uh nirvana's smells like teen spirit which is really like the first song uh that really got popular with them that in itself was sort of a okay. generational ballad a little mini revolution among generations so that's a pretty good one um underdog fight it's a tie probably it could be eye of the tiger or it could be the actual rocky theme song i'm leaning oh. towards the actual rocky theme song from one and two right i the tiger didn't show up till three when they moved off to california and, and rocky that's right work um i'm a bigger fan of the original one mostly because in rocky one you remember he actually loses the fight he yeah tells, yeah tells adrian to a decision yeah right well to a decision that many people thought went the other way and that's the whole justification for rocky yeah. two and I, I mean, what we're we at 19 now, but you know, the thing that I think is interesting, he tells Adrian midway through the movie that he doesn't care about winning. He cares about going the distance so that he could prove himself. Right. Exactly. And that's so, what the underdog so fight others is about, can see right? Yeah. Exactly. So, so probably, probably in that one. And then, you know, the ally fight, probably the best reminder that it's not about you. It's about them would be like uh, the Beatles help um, or any cover of yeah. that song I think would be, uh, would be great. So that's, that's four that, uh, right. That's yeah. But that's pretty good. That's, yeah. that's a good yeah. solid 20, 25 minutes of listening. Uh, you know, yeah, that's a good solid EP right there. I, I love it. You know, and, and I'm, I'm going to throw those in my, uh, phone and go out for a run now. Yeah. Actually, I think three of those songs are on my workout playlist on my phone. Oh, very uh, nice. I guess I should add the Beatles help, but I don't, I feel like if I'm deadlifting like 400 pounds, I don't need a Beatles song in my ear. <laughs> So well, maybe if you need a spotter and you just, yeah, there you to, go. Yeah. Just yeah. Remind you to say help. <laughs> awesome. Well, David, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for your time here. We have learned a lot and I can't wait to 
continue with my crusade. I can't wait to hear of the other fights that everybody out there is going to start picking, hopefully not fighting with each other, but fighting, fighting the real fight. David, thank you so much. Oh, thank you again so much for having me. Well, there you go. I hope you enjoyed that talk with David Burkus and learned how to pick a fight. Be sure and download his book, Pick a Fight. I'll put a link in the notes below, as well as a link to David's soundtrack for Pick a Fight. I've got a Spotify playlist I'll put in the notes below. Have you and your team gotten on board with the fight for simplicity? Are you and your team leading the crusade in your company against complexity? If not, then I've got a resource for you that you can download. It's going to help you understand the steps to take. It's going to walk you through some of the questions to ask on how you can simplify your company's experiences. It's the simple playbook. You can go to mattliles.com slash simple playbook and download it today. It's going to help you and your team pick a fight against complexity. Hey, I hope you're enjoying listening to the Simple Brand Podcast. I love having you with us today. Um, I'd love it if you hit the subscribe button. And when you do, that's going to be a lot simpler for you to get future episodes. We've got some great episodes coming up. Lots of more great interviews. Lots of fun guests. More lessons from me, Matt Lyles. So hit the subscribe button, and then you can automatically make sure that you get those new episodes as soon as they're live. Until then, keep it simple. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simple Brand Podcast. Want to make your listening experience simple and automatically receive each new episode? Visit our website, simplebrandpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. If you're finding value from the Simple Brand Podcast, leave us a rating or review. That helps us get the show to the ears of the people who need it most. Be sure to catch Matt right here next week. Same Matt time, same Matt channel. Until then, keep it simple.